whole problems involving the so-called sound barrier. It was these shockwaves at transonic speeds that were causing all the problems. Transonic is a region of flight where you have uh, supersonic flow over part of the aircraft and subsonic flow over part of the aircraft. It's a very difficult region to understand, even today, because you have this mix of flows between the two. Fully supersonic and fully subsonic are relatively easy to understand, but this transonic region becomes more difficult because of the different areas of the aircraft that are obeying different laws of aerodynamics. The way this is uh, manifest to the pilot is that the shock wave moves back and forth very rapidly over the top of the wing, many, many, many times a second. 40 years of wing design needed rethinking. Now what I'm showing here is a typical wing about 12% thick, which means that that distance there is 12% of that distance. If you could say slim that down to 6%, the effects of the shock waves might be put off so you could go faster before you would get into these problems. History was about to turn full circle. The early planes did have thin wings. designed to slice through the air. As aerodynamics became better understood, its thick wing could accommodate struts, wheels and weapons. Clearly, there could be no going back. In pre-war World War II Germany, they discovered a simple and perfect solution. One that used a thick wing, which appeared thin to the oncoming airflow. So we now have exactly the same thickness there but we've got a much longer distance so it's relatively more slender this is no longer the straight wings old looking things with a jet engine slapped on this is a real modern fighter as we think of it today as a jet fighter. The F-86 Sabre looks like a modern jet warplane. And it was fast, but the Sabre still couldn't punch through the barrier. Close to the speed of sound, vibration and buffeting rendered the controls useless. It seemed like the barrier really was unbeatable. In October 1946, at Muroc Dry Lake in California to become Edwards Air Force Base, a top secret research craft was making its first flight. But this wasn't a jet plane. It was small with straight, razor-thin wings, not swept. This was little more than a rocket-powered bullet. It was called the Bell X-1, and it had been built for one and one purpose only, to punch through the barrier. The X-1 program, then called the XS-1 for Experimental Sonic 1, uh, was a development program to try and develop a research supersonic aircraft capability. With enough fuel for a 90-second powered flight, it was launched from a B-29 Superfortress. And yet, when the aircraft went to full power, it too failed. As the plane entered the transonic region, the Bell X-1 went into an uncontrollable dive. The control surfaces that pitched the craft, either up or down like any plane, weren't on the front wings, but on the rear ones. The focus was now on the tail.
This is a model of the tail of the X1. As the surfaces at the end of the tail move up or down, they affect pressure on the oncoming air and force the whole rig up or down, just like a real plane. As the wind tunnel powers up, the effect of the elevators on the rig can easily be seen. Crucially, these wind speeds are well below the transonic danger zone. When smoke is added, you can see the smooth airflow around the airfoil. But close to the speed of sound, shock waves on the front wings create turbulent air for anything in their wake. This means that the elevators on the tail are operating in dead air, rendering the controls useless. So what happens is the airflow, instead of flowing smoothly back over the, the trailing edge of the wing, is that it separates and you have this large dead weight um, caused by this shock wave. The problem is all the control surfaces are right there in this dead wake and so you lose a bit of control authority when this happens. And so there's a, a very real danger of a pilot not having the fine control that, that they're used to having. On the Bell X-1 that danger was putting the life of the pilot on the line. And the X-Team weren't the only ones to know this. The British government had their own secret plan to be the first to look what lay beyond the sonic glass ceiling. And it involved none other than Frank Whittle. In 1943, three years before the X-1 got off the drawing board, the Miles Company had been commissioned by the British government to build what would be called the M-52. It was estimated that they would be able to achieve a Mach number of about 1.1, or something like a thousand miles an hour. And it was to be piloted by none other than Eric Brown. I had been alerted by the director of the RE that I would likely be the pilot to do the first flight in this <clears throat> and do the supersonic testing. With the project nearing completion, there was suddenly devastating news. Frank Whittle, ignored by the government in 1929, shunned by the War Department in 1935, was now dropped by the powers that be and told to pack up. The project was cancelled. Before the M52 was cancelled, we were instructed to give all the data to the Americans. In the package sent to America was one technical innovation that would make all the difference, the tail. In the flying tail, instead of having the moving bit, you make the whole tail solid, and then you move the whole tail, the solid tail. The tail of the M52 didn't have small elevators controlling the pitch of the aircraft. Instead, the whole tail pivoted up or down. At the flick of a switch, the whole tail can present an angle up or down to the oncoming airstream. There's a very big difference between just using the elevator on its own, where I mean, it moved hardly at all up and down, whereas moving the whole tailplane, we get a very big difference. The increased surface area of this new tail might make the difference in the turbulent transonic air. The British Miles team had been the first to realize the potential of the all-moving tail, and now the Americans came to the same conclusion and the X-1 was modified. Now it was time to find out if it worked. On the 14th of October, 1947, the Bell X-1 took to the skies again. But this time, it had an all-moving tail. It was a memorable day. The day when Bell...